Thank you guys for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me to this. Uh, it's great to be here. So um, I thought I'd start by just pointing out that uh, women have made tremendous progress. Um, I think that's fair to say. Um, one way to think about that is in terms of the pay gap. It exists. How large it is depends on who you ask. But over the last three decades, that gap has certainly shrunk. Um, according to some, half of managers are women. Um, and then we can think about education. Um, in the US, more women have tertiary degrees than men. And so I think there's a lot to, to celebrate. Uh, at the same time, I think there's uh, room for some improvements. I could spend the next 15 minutes giving you examples of that. Um, but I thought I'd just show this one slide. It's, it's not my figure. Um, but it's just showing you uh, 18 prominent tech companies and the percentage of women in these tech companies over five years. Um, along the top, you see the US population, the circle. Uh, denotes what percentage of women there are at these companies. And um, what we can see here is that women make up more than half of the population. So that's the red line going across uh, at the very top. And they've made up more than half of the population for the last five years. Um, what we can also see is that, well, women are vastly underrepresented um, in tech companies. That's completely obvious to everyone in this room. I think it's completely obvious to everyone outside of this room. Um, I don't think we should be particularly comfortable with it, um, but it's just an example of some of the uh, work that um, we still need to do. All right, so um, uh, in my kind of research, I focus more narrowly on negotiations. And one of the things I'm especially interested in is the role of gender in negotiations. So do women have different experiences at the bargaining table? Do women face unique challenges at the bar bargaining table? And importantly, how can we help women more effectively navigate these challenges to close some of these gaps that exist, um, where promotion rates are concerned, um, where you know, CEO numbers are concerned. All right. And so I thought I'd start by talking about um, two challenges that women face at, at the bargaining table. Um, I'm not going to mince my words today. I think it's fair to say that um, there is some acceptance, some social acceptance around women receiving less. Okay. On some level, society accepts that. Um, you can just look at the gap in pay. I don't think it's quite as large as the figures that get tossed around, but I think it exists. I think it's very prevalent. Um, we can look at some experimental work. So this is a, a study that shows that women receive less in response for their requests for resources, um, except if they um, have a fancy title. Then we don't see those differences. Um, it's not just that males think women deserve less. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that women feel entitled to less. So, um, you know, if you tell women, like, you know, this is approximately what people make as a salary, they, if they have market information, their expectations are, are just as high as men. It's when there's no uh, information available to them that, that, generally speaking, they feel less entitled. So one of these studies, what they do is they have males and females do a, a task. It's just a menial task for an hour. And then they ask, what should your wage be? How much should we pay you for the last hour of work? And women ask for less than men do. Okay. And so it's not especially surprising that women are less likely to initiate a negotiation. Um, and that is true in the absence of strong norms dictating a requirement to negotiate. So if it's clear that everyone negotiates in this context, women will negotiate. But absent um, those strong norms, they are less likely to initiate a negotiation. Now, it's obviously going to be a little harder to negotiate effectively if, if people think you deserve fewer resources and if on some level you think you deserve fewer resources. I think what compounds the issue further are, are gender roles. So what are gender roles? They're socially shared expectations regarding the appropriate behavior of women and men. So um, we make assumptions about what men and women are generally like. So we assume that men are going to be dominant, that they're going to be ambitious, that they're going to be unemotional. And we assume that women are going to be nurturing, affectionate, concerned with others. Importantly, those assumptions about what men and women are like tend to become expectations as to how men and women should act. So they become social norms. 
And critically, um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that people, males and females, who deviate from these prescriptions, from these expectations, are punished. Um, there's, a, there's a backlash. Um, it can be a financial one. It can be a social one. There is a ton of work looking at women in the workplace and assertive behavior among women in the workplace. Um, there's also work looking at assertive behavior in negotiations in particular. And what this work suggests is that when women assert, um, they're seen as slightly less likable. They're seen as slightly less socially competent as compared to when men exhibit the same behavior. Um, now, of course, the problem is that you know, to be effective at negotiations, you certainly have to facilitate collective problem solving and cooperation. But I think it's hard to do well without a degree of asserting. Now, lest you think that um, these results are just theoretical or that maybe uh, we wouldn't find you know, these attitudes towards women asserting in a progressive city like New York City among people who are motivated and thoughtful and smart, um, here's some data that I've collected from students over the years. And I use this to kind of initiate a conversation about the role of gender negotiations. So imagine you were in my study. I would tell you, uh, imagine that you're the dean at a, at a school and that your job is to negotiate with faculty. Um, there's a, this faculty member who you guys have made an offer to. Either the faculty member's name is Christine or it's Christopher. And so you hear one or the other. And then um, you're told that starting salaries typically range uh, between sixty dollars to $85,000. And Christine or Christopher has signaled that they, they're expecting $90,000. Okay? We then ask you um, or our students, our participants, how assertive is your negotiation partner? And then we ask some questions about um, that get at social consequences. So how much would you enjoy liking with this? How much would you like working with this person? How likable is this person? And what I'm showing you here is the orange bars are associated with Christine. The cayenne bars are associated with Christopher. And I'm breaking it up um, into male responses by male students and female students. And so what you can see here is that um, both male students and female students see that ask as more assertive when it comes from Christine as compared to when it comes from Christopher. And then the second graph is looking at some of the social consequences associated with being assertive. And what I'm showing you here is that um, there is a, a small backlash, um, and it's in this data set coming from female students who say, Christine's assertive, and I'm not sure I'd enjoy working with her. Okay? Um, you know, I, I think it, that doesn't always happen just with women. I think it happens with both genders. Um, but this is to say that you know, there, are, there are double standards where male and female behavior is concerned. And there are double standards where assertiveness is concerned. All right. Um, now, you know, the, the challenge I think that you face in most negotiation, no matter your gender, is that you probably want to do well where relational outcomes are concerned, but you also want to do well where financial outcomes are concerned. And, and those are not sort of directly in conflict from each other, but, but they can be to some extent. So you're trying to find a balance between doing well financially without alienating the other person. And I think the suggestion here is that that balance is a little um, more difficult to obtain if you're a female. While I could leave you with the depressing data that I just showed you, um, I think you know, negotiation scholars are sort of guilty of not providing some useful advice as to how to move forward. So I'm going to attempt to just give you four strategies um, for claiming value without backlash. These are strategies anyone can use. But again, I think they're especially useful for women because they potentially yield better deal terms without alienating your, your negotiation partner. All right, so first, first strategy. Um, be precise. Now let me explain this study to you and then I'll talk about the implications um, for, for value claiming. Um, so Adam is one of the first people to do some research suggesting that first offers work as anchors in negotiations. Imagine that I am selling something. I was going to ask for, for $15, um, but the buyer went first and they said, I'll buy it for 10. Once I hear 10, I think, oh, you know what, I'll ask for 12. Right? I hear what they offered. I adjust my expectations in the direction of the offer that they made. So I'm, I'm not as ambitious with my counter offer. And what this leads to is, in many negotiation contexts, first offer makers doing better as compared to the person who goes second. Everyone with me there? 
All right, so um, we had a project where we were looking at um, the potency of, of a first offer. So um, the, the idea was that, well, when people say, I'll sell it to you for $100, it kind of sounds arbitrary. Like they got it from nowhere. Like they just pulled that figure out from their back pocket, right? Um, and so the question we had was, do um, anchors work better if they're more precisely expressed? So do you do better as a seller saying, um, I'll sell it to you for $95, which is more conciliatory, as compared to $100? Because um, your negotiation counterpart has a difficult time saying that's a ridiculous starting figure. We should, we should go with something that I like more. When they say 100, I think people have an easier time adjusting, saying that's a, a, a crap starting point. Um, that's arbitrary. It's not a valuable. Um, you just kind of made that figure up. Um, and so this is what we're testing in this study. So this study involves 130 pairs. They're negotiating over the sale of a Honda Accord. Um, half of buyers are instructed to make a precise offer to say, um, I'll buy it for $9,975. The other half of people are not told anything because everybody makes round offers. Um, what I am showing you here is, um, so these are all buyers making the offers. What I'm showing you here are the adjustments that the sellers made when they're coming up with their counter offers. So what we're predicting is that people who received round offers had an easier time saying, that's a crappy starting figure. Um, let's go with something that, that I like better. Um, and in fact, we're finding that effect. So this shows precise offer makers um, are doing better. And that precise offer makers indeed negotiate better final settlements as opposed to round offer makers. Now critically, one of the key points um, that I want to sort of highlight for you here is we also ask sellers to rate their perceptions of the buyer. Um, how likable is this person? How obnoxious is this person? And what I'm showing you here is that just precise offer makers do better, but it doesn't come at interpersonal costs. They're seen as just as likable as round offer makers. So the take home from this is, you know, be precise. Not ridiculously precise, but as, again, as a seller, you're better off saying, I'll sell it to you for $95, which is more conciliatory, as compared to 100 Everyone with me? Right. OK. Um, second suggestion, use a bolstered range. Um, for years, students would ask my colleague Daniel Ames and I, um, Professor, do I do any better if I say I'll sell it to you for $100 to $120 as compared to if I say I'll sell it to you for $100? And we would say, don't be an idiot. If you say I'll sell it to you for $100 to $120, the buyer just hears you'll sell it for $100. Okay? Don't be dumb, right? The buyer is just going to hear the end of the con hear the end of the continuum that they want to hear, the self-serving end. Just ask for 120 is what we would say. Turns out that that's wrong, everyone. That is wrong. Um, I know I'm speaking quickly. Wrong. Um, so what I am showing you here is a study um, where we have three types of offer makers. These are all sellers. We have a point offer maker who said, I'll sell it to you for $8,000. We have someone who made what I'm calling a bolstered range offer. So they said, I'll sell it to you for $8,000 to $9,000, right? That second figure is, is more aggressive. Um, and then we have um, some participants who said, I'll sell it to you for um, $9,000. Just it, it would be like saying, I'll sell it to you for 120. Remember, we said, that's what you should do. So what I'm showing you here, higher numbers are better because these are sellers making the offer. What I'm showing you here is that there is a difference between saying, I'll sell it to you for 100 um, versus 100 to 120, right? So people who made that bolstered offer did better than people who just used the point offer. Um, the buyer doesn't just disregard the end of the continuum that they don't want to hear. They hear both, and both ends of the continuum shape their behavior. Um, with regard to the bumped up offer, just asking for the more extreme end of the range, what we find is if you do that, uh, the risk of having an impasse in the negotiation goes up considerably. And so bolster range offers are sort of a way for you, a low risk way for you to work in a more assertive figure without alienating your negotiation partner. Um, again, we looked at interpersonal outcomes here. Um, and what I'm showing you here is um, negative versus positive impressions of the offer maker. Um, we asked, to what extent did you see the seller as stubborn, aggressive, weak, um, reasonable, flexible? And what I'm showing you here is that um, 
offer makers who used the bolstered offer were actually seen more positively um, than those who used the, the point offer, despite the fact that the bolstered offer is objectively more aggressive. Okay, so I'm gonna just have to go with three strategies, guys, because I'm running out of time. Um, but so what's the advice here? If you wanna say, sell something for $100, you should say, I'll sell it to you for 120 to 140. Okay, so you wanna build some room um, with your first offer so that you can concede and still hit that target of 100, so obviously. Um, but you'll do better saying, I'll sell to you for 120 to 140 versus saying, I'll sell to you for 120. And better than if you said, I'll sell to you for 140 because 140 gets risky, okay? All right, last thing that I'll say is that I think um, bias is much more likely to creep in when there is ambiguity, okay? When ambiguity is high. There's like a ton of research that would suggest that that's true. Given that that's the case, I think it's so important for you to come to the table having done your research, um, looked, look, having looked at facts and figures, having asked friends um, what's a reasonable price here, um, looking for precedents, um, asking an expert, whatever you can do to arm yourself with information that effectively removes the ambiguity, that convinces the person you're negotiating with that in fact what you're asking for is perfectly reasonable. I don't think that most people, um, I think that most people want to be fair. I don't think that most people think that they are, bi they are biased. They just need a little bit of help. And so if you come armed with these facts and figures, um, I think, one, it gives you more confidence in the negotiation, but I also think it, it helps them see that your behavior, in fact, isn't especially aggressive and assertive. You're just asking for a reasonable figure. Okay, so that would be my, my third piece of advice. Oh, no, I don't want to eat in your time. Oh, I knew he'd do that. He's so nice and supportive of my meal plan. All right, the fourth one's a little bit challenging. Okay, so the last thing to say is um, one of my favorite, favorite studies was done by um, Emily Amanatula, who used to be a PhD student at Columbia, Columbia, and one of our colleagues, Michael Morris. And what they do is they have women negotiate on behalf of themselves, or they have women negotiate on behalf of other people, so in an advocacy role. And what they find is that women are much more assertive when they are in this advocacy role. And the explanation they sort of provide is, well, when you're advocating for others, you know, an assertive ask is consistent with what's prescribed for women, to be communal, to be concerned with others' needs. Um, and then what they show is that the difference in assertiveness between women who are negotiating on behalf of themselves versus on behalf of others is entirely explained by women's concern um, that they're gonna receive some backlash um, when they're negotiating on behalf of themselves. So that's really what's driving their behavior. So we thought about sort of a natural extension to this finding. So, so that study is focused on how can you get women to be more assertive. This finding is, um, really designed to get at, well, if you signal as a female that you are in an advocacy role, will you diminish the likelihood that you receive social backlash from your negotiation partner? Okay, so this is about perceptions um, of assertive offers. I already showed you this data. Do you guys remember? You were in my study. You were a dean. Uh, you were negotiating with Christine or Christopher. And I showed that you know, Christine was seen as more assertive um, and that she received a backlash. Um, I skipped over a detail. Um, this was one goal, but there was this, this other goal to this project, which was to see whether this advocacy strategy could work. And so um, I'm gonna show you data just for Christine. Um, so this is the scenario you were asked to read. Christine asked for $90,000. And then some Christine said, this isn't just about me. This is about my family. We need to be able to live comfortably. So signaled that it's for me plus a bunch of other people. I'm an advocate. I'm an agent. And um, this is judgments of Christine when she did not signal that she was an advocate, and this is judgments of Christine when she did signal that. And so what I'm showing you is Christine is seen as less assertive when she positions her ask as an act of communality. Um, we also see that there's less of a backlash when she positions her ask as an act of communality. Now, one thing to say is, do I know the magical thing to say? No. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is I think there are lots of things you can say, one. And number two is, 
like it's the rare negotiation where there aren't other stakeholders. In most negotiation situations, you're negotiating on behalf of yourself and at least one other person. Okay, find some way to signal signal that. All right. Um, and then final thoughts, um, is it annoying that you need to think about clever ways to claim without alienating? Absolutely. I agree. Like on some level, I, I'm, I'm putting myself in your position. I'm like, oh, this is annoying. But here's the thing. What I don't want to do is stop at just telling you, you're not totally imagining it. Um, people judge your assertive behavior more harshly. Um, I'm not comfortable with that either. So I'm in a bind, everyone. Um, and to, to my mind, it's useful to provide you with some guidance moving forward. Um, if there's a silver lining in this, I do think um, being prepared in negotiations pays off a lot. Um, and so you know, some of this stuff forces you to be more prepared. And I think that's in your interest. Um, one other thing just to say is that um, you know, maybe your definition for success for some negotiations should be that you want to be liked. I think there are negotiation situations where that should be the goal. You don't really care about the financial outcomes. But one of the things you should be asking yourself before every last negotiation is, what's success to me? Um, I think too often women perhaps maybe default to their definition of success as being liked. Sometimes you want to be liked. My guess is sometimes that's less important to you than getting good financial outcomes. Commit to what success means to you and be OK with that. Um, and then women, let's not be complicit. Let's be more celebratory of women who assert. Final thing to say, oh, Adam, you're amazing. Um, express gratitude to all the phenomenal men who've, who've helped make our careers. I know that I have made a career on the back of, of many, many supportive men. And I think it's in our interest to be really grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's always hard to follow Malia because she's such an amazing speaker. Um, I will say um, a couple of things um, really quickly. One is um, a term that you can remember for the advocacy effect, and I think it's perfectly captured in the study that Malia did, is people sometimes call it the mama bear effect. And I think it's like you know this idea of the, the mama bear defending her cubs. Um, when you're seen as sort of supporting and defending other people, um, you're more likely to then be uh, allotted what I call a wider range of acceptable behavior, allowed to be a bit more assertive. Um, you can also understand why, as chair, I made Malia Mason the junior faculty liaison. That is the person that is in a position of authority who is very definition is to advocate on behalf of the less powerful individuals um, in the room. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about why um, women need power, and I'm going to present a bunch of data um, analyzing um, a century of statewide elections. And this is a, a project really driven by a doctoral student named Brian Pike. Um, and uh, he's really run all these analyses and we've co-created some of the ideas, but he's really the engine behind it. Um, and to, just to start off, this is um, a little bit of an uh, application of my book, Friend and Foe. Um, in this book, I describe how in every relationship that we have in the world, every relationship is characterized by fundamental tension between uh, cooperation on the one hand and competition on the other. Even when you're getting married and you're about to have the most cooperative event of your life, right? With forming a union with another person, you often compete over the details of the wedding. Um, when you become a new parent, uh, this again, this cooperative task of raising this young child, uh, you often compete over things like sleep or some free time for yourself. Um, and in this book, I, I, I go through a lot of different ways ways that this plays out. Um, and one of the chapters is on gender and diversity. Um, and so some of these ideas are coming from that. Um, I'm going to go through quickly a little bit of ideas, because Malia set them up already. Um, but basically, we can see there's a, a gap in the amount that women get paid relative to men. There's a huge gap in the boardroom. Malia already showed you that data at the bottom, uh, the percentage of women who are CEOs or on boards of Fortune 500 companies. Um, and research has tried to understand why that occurs. And, and Malia already touched on this, so I'll go through it quickly. One is something called um, a double standard. It basically says that the threshold um, is higher for women to be given the same credit than it is for men. Or the same positive accomplishment by a man is given greater congratulations or laudatory reactions than the same behavior done by a woman. And so we can see, for example, in a great study by Allison Wood Brooks of HBS, they showed that investors are twice as likely to fund a pitch 
even if it's word to word the same pitch when delivered by a man than by a woman. Um, some great research done by a doctoral student, Donna Kahn's at um, Columbia, um, she showed one of the reasons why women are less likely to get um, uh, funding from in entrepreneurial pitches is because they get asked a lot of follow-up questions around failure or preventing failure, whereas the men get asked a lot of questions about about how they're going to achieve success. Um, and we can even see in one study, identical resumes sent to real scientists around the country for a lab manager position, identical resumes randomly assigned to be either called Jennifer or John. The male applicant was hired more often than the female applicant. So this is really what we mean by the double standard. There's a different standard for accomplishment for men and women. Um, and I love this quote uh, about uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, who became famous together. But we have Fred Astaire Film Festival, Fred Astaire Dance Company, and this person runs out, yeah, he was great. But don't forget, Ginger Rogers did everything he did, but backwards and on heels. Um, now, the second problem is you call the gender double bind. Um, and Malia already talked about this. Right, that if you don't speak up and advocate for yourself, you don't get anything. But if you do, there's often a backlash. And she's already touched on this, but other studies show that women are punished for expressing ambition. Um, women, women are punished for asking for raises and better offers and negotiations. Um, and here's just a great real world example of this that personifies everything that Malia spoke about. Um, this was the CEO of Microsoft basically telling women not to ask. He's like, oh, it's not about asking for a raise, but knowing having faith that the system will give you the right raise at the right time. You know, it's karma if you don't ask. Um, didn't work out too well. But I want to just show you um, the best example of this. So Malia and I both teach negotiations. And we have students come to us and say, I want, to, I want to get help in crafting a response to this job offer. And the things that Malia and I and Dan Ames and all these other people who teach negotiations say, um, the first thing you want to do absolutely first thing you want to do is you want to express excitement. Talk about how excited you are to be there. And you want to ask for things. Now, you want to do exactly what Malia said. You want to give them some examples of um, market data that would support your thing. But you also want to come across as flexible. So you don't want to come across as demanding. Now, Malia talked about maybe doing ranges. In a minute, I'm going to talk about another idea in one second. Um, but this is um, a real world case. A woman received an offer to be a faculty member at Nazareth College. And this is, the, I mean, literally, if I had written this email for, on behalf of a student, it would look exactly like this. So this is what she wrote. She said, as you know, I'm enthusiastic about the possibility of coming to Nazareth. You know, granting some of the provisions will make my job easier. I'm not, I'm not saying I won't come if you don't grant them all. I'll just make it easier. You know, an increase of salary, which is in line, market data, with other professors, right? An official semester for maternity leave, which doesn't seem that out of thing. A pre-tenure sabbatical, that might be the more pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, no more than three new preps per year for the first three years. That's something that people often ask for. Um, and then she'd say, look, you, know, you don't have to pay me the first year. I'm going to go do a postdoc somewhere else, and I'll come with more research experience and teaching experience. And then she says, I know that some of these might be easier to grant than others. Let me know what you think, right? Signaling flexibility. They withdrew the offer from her, right? You know, and so this is just one of those examples of, of situations. So this gender double standard and this gender double bind create an unequal playing field. Now, one of the things that I become very interested in in my career is really, and I spoke about this last year, so if anyone saw me speak last year, um, I have a phrase that I say often, which is that um, gender differences are often power differences in disguise. And um, I've actually come up with a phrase called the low power double bind to say that the experience that women um, have if this double bind is really symptomatic of a larger phenomenon that when we lack power, sometimes because of a social role or social identity, like being a woman in a man's world. Sometimes it's not having any alternatives in a negotiation. Sometimes it's being lower in the hierarchy. We start to experience that. So what I'm going to do in one second is I'm going to tell you about a bunch of political data. But I am going to just follow up on Malia's talk first, because um, Malia's research has really inspired me. I should, tell you, I should tell you that her research on ranges literally changed my life. I had started teaching negotiations since 1999, and I had always told exactly what she said. Do not make a range. Do not make a range. Do not make a range. And then I read her paper. Um, came out the same year she was coming up for tenure, which was a great year for that paper to come out. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, 
But I started to use her technique when negotiating with clients for speaking opportunities. And the first time I did it, I was, it was a situation where a company wanted me to fly to three different locations and give talks for their, for their, for their people. And I was going to have a baby in about a month. And so I was a little uncomfortable whether to go or not. And so I was thinking, well, let me just throw out the highest number I could think of. And if they say no, it's fine. And they said, that number makes me feel really uncomfortable. But wait, Malia told me, just add a number on top of that. <laughs> and so I added a number on top of that. And then they granted me the lower end. Now, She's right. They're probably going to grant you the lower end. But the lower end was higher than what I would have felt comfortable doing without the other number, right? So I do this all the time now. Um, and it's worked. Um, fortunately, I don't actually have to pay her a commission for all of this advice. It's, it's in the scientific literature. I do just want to add one other negotiation technique that um, extends this work that Malia, that I've done with a couple of colleagues. Um, which is, and I think gets around this and really captures this idea of gender and power together. So if we just take Malia's idea and we do a small, subtle little twist on it, which is what if we think about not just giving people a range, but what if we're negotiating we give them two different options? Now, this, of course, requires more than one issue on the negotiation table. Here's the easiest example that you could ever imagine. Ready? A car salesperson says to you, I'll give you this car for $25,000 and a five-year warranty, or I'll give it to you for $24,000 and a three-year warranty. So what's the effect of that, right? So clearly what they've done in their mind is they've calculated a year warranty is worth $500. So those two offers are financially equivalent to the car salesperson who's giving it to you. And what I've shown in this research is three really important things. Here's the first one. The first is that, just like she said, precise offers are more potent. They keep you on that number more. So do these things where you do multiple offers. The second thing is that, actually, when you do multiple offers, you're actually seen as more cooperative in the same way that you're seen as more cooperative when you offer a range. I think that's incredibly important. But here's the third thing, which I think is incredibly important and valuable. Making multiple offers in negotiation works equally well for everyone. It works for men, and it works for women. It also works for high power and low power. So we did in one study, we negotiated. We said, you have a really strong outside offer, or you have a really weak outside offer. And then they made multiple offers. Now, the people on strong offers got better outcomes on average. There's a main effect of power. But the effect of multiple offers was equally effective for the high and low power individuals. So one of the things that you're going to talk about now with politics that I become very interested in is thinking about you know, the role of power and the role of gender differences. I sometimes use a phrase that you know, um, power, uh, sex differences are really power differences in disguise that really captures this. So I'm going to tell you a little about some research I've done um, on voting. There's a very famous research that suggests that one of the reasons why there is a major gender gap in the United States and the House of Representatives and state legislators everywhere is not that women are punished at the ballot box and they're less likely to win, is that women don't run. Now, what they do in this is they use a lot of survey results. And they ask people who are potential aspirants to political office, you know, are you comfortable running? Would you be willing to run? You have this experience that would make you relevant for a political um, uh, election. Um, and women, on average, in these surveys say, I don't feel comfortable running. Now, these are all based on surveys. So what did this graduate student Brian Pike do? Well, he took every single election in the history of the United States for US senator and governor, so the highest positions, the highest executive and the highest um, legislative position in any state since women were granted the right to vote, which is still less than 100 years, which is insane, um, since 1920. And he created, this is the key methodological insight he did. What he did is he created what's called a risk poll. That is, he took people who were already in elected office, so people in the House of Representatives, state attorney generals, et cetera, and he just looked and see, did they run? Not did they win, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but did they run? Did, when they had the opportunity to run, did they run? And we observed whether each of these office holders ran for senator or governor, this highest office in their state, when they had the opportunity. And there's two really fascinating pieces of information when you actually look at real behavior by real people. The first is, it looks like the surveys are wrong. Women and men run at identical rates. But there's a huge but. 
And I think this tells us a lot about some of the stuff that um, Malia spoke about, which is that experience matters a lot. So when the surveys are all done on people with no experience, huge gender gap. But women, basically, this dotted line tells you men are completely indifferent to their level of experience and expertise. Men are highly, and women are highly sensitive to their experience, right? So for women are actually more likely to run uh, given the opportunity, but only they've had a lot of experience. So we can start to see that. So what can we say? The past surveys are right and wrong, right? Women do run, but not without experience. Now here's another same data set. I'm going to come back to in a minute. But when women do run, they have to do exactly what Malia said. They have to be ambitious. They have to debate. They have to fundraise. They have to do negative advertising. And all of these things lead to a backlash, right? Some of the things that we've heard. So the question that I ask is, well, what can shield women from these biases? And Brian Pike and I asked this together. And Brian came up with a great phrase for this. He calls it the power shield. So it's really power can do that. So what do we do? We went back to this exact same data set that we had before, analyzed everything. Now we looked at to see who's going to win. But we coded every election for power. So we considered a candidate running for office to be low power if they were going up against a current incumbent. So they were the challenger to an incumbent. We considered them kind of equal power if they were going for an open seat. That means there was no one who's currently in that. And then they were in a powerful position if they were currently the incumbent. So, and then we determined the winning rates for women and men by this power position. And I'm going to show you now the data by power. So what happens when you are a challenger? Is there a gender effect? There is a massive gender effect. Um, women, uh, men are three times more likely to win than women when they're challenging someone in power. Now what happens when the open seat? There's still a gender effect, but it's really small. Now men are only 20% more likely. Before, they were 300% more likely. Now it's just 20% more likely. But there's still a, a significant gap there. Now what happens when both a male and a female are in the incumbent role? And now you can actually see there's basically no effect. There's a small little trend for women to actually perform um, better in this. So what is our conclusion here? Is that gender differences can be reduced when women have more power and more experience, right? both in terms of their own ambition and comfortable running, but also in terms of their ability to win um, at the election table. And this gets exactly, exactly what Malia was saying. I want to end with one other final thought. Um, Kathy Phillips and I wrote a piece for Huffington Post. And one of the things that we did when we wrote those pieces, we were just kind of thinking about, you know, we talk about the history of racism in the United States and how strong it is and, and, and the barriers that people face by race. And they are significant. They are important. But we were both struck, the, struck by the fact that an um, African-American male um, won an, uh, an election to the presidency before a woman, any woman. Um, of any ethnicity. In fact, some people are now asking whether a gay mayor is more likely to win the presidency than a woman, right? So these, these same questions are coming up. And I started thinking when Kathy and I were discussing this idea just about um, popular culture. And what we did is we went back and we looked at every fictional president in the 20 years before Obama was elected. And there was um, six black male presidents and four female presidents. So there was a little bit more of that. But here's where it got really interesting. Of the six black male presidents, all of them were elected to their position. Of those four female presidents, three of them became president, sworn into office after the elected president was incapacitated. <laughs> um, and one of them even poisoned the president, right? So. Um, <laughs> We even saw, and this isn't new, right? We saw this recently in Veep, where uh, uh, Julia Dreyfus became president after the president was incapacitated. And then the woman who was eventually became president in the election was not popularly elected, but was elected by the Senate in this very complicated thing. So I think the other conclusion I would say is gender differences can be reduced when women are seen as powerful role models, not just in real life, but also in fictional life, in pop culture. I think that just seeing these black male presidents duly elected and being successful on TV and in movies made it more comfortable in the imagination to imagine a black male president being, um, uh, black male candidate being president. So uh, just to end, that's a picture of Brian Pike, who really did this amazing research, um, you know, buy my book. And then Malia and I will answer some questions. <laughs> yeah. 
so we're, we'll both answer any questions. There's one way back there. I think we got a microphone for you. Uh, I'm really curious about your research, but more in light of your thoughts about an outlier to that research. So for example, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, she beat the incumbent, uh, Joe Crowley. What are your thoughts about that, and what do you think specifically enabled her to be successful, just given the fact that she was going against an incumbent, someone that was well-known and popular? And, yeah, I, right and I also want to say, uh, Professor me. Mason, yes. um, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. I took your course. I was an EMBA student, um, and it helped me with my uh, wedding negotiation specifically. So, uh, <laughs> I love you. Um, um, I'll, I'll just say one thing. I mean, I, I do think that, you know, one thing that I think two things that I think are really important are just in, in terms of self-presentation, right? Which is um, one is this idea of authenticity um, and comfort with you know what you're expressing and saying. I think that there's one thing that I think also happens when um, sometimes when women try to be assertive, they hedge with their assertiveness or they go so far to like be. I have to be this certain way because of these restrictions that I face. And there's something about. Um, uh, the Cortez that's just so authentic and she's just comfortable with her belief and it's a, a you know very clear belief system you know socialist belief system and so there's something about that this conviction and this authenticity that I think really matters I think one of the things that Hillary Clinton always struggled with was this question of authenticity now I think she was put in that box because how she was treated in 1992 Right when she tried to be herself, she got lambasted, and then she had to start trying to bake cookies and be the person that she thought that people wanted her to be. So I think she always struggled with that. But I think you know, for someone um, like Cortez, she is in a, a state where she's you know she's young, she's t passionate, um, authentic, truly expressing herself, and I think those goes go a long way. Now I'll just say one last thing is that um, there's a doctoral student, um, Jan. Do you remember? I can never pronounce it. Yakimowitz, um, who's going to be a professor at HBS. He just graduated with us at, at Columbia. Um, he studies work on passion, and we tried to study. We had this great idea. We're going to study the passion penalty against women, and we just actually didn't find very any studies that really showed a penalty against women who were really passionate. So there, there's something also in um, Liz Bailey Wolf at Harvard did some studies where she showed that if you um, if you show a lot of emotion but describe it as passion, um, that mitigates any negative effects both for men and women. So I think there's something about passion authenticity that's really important. Hi, um, this sort of correlates with your graph that you're showing with um, men running for office and women with um, versus ex um, their experience. I recently read a study, gender study, where in elementary school, boys, and I, I, forgive me for getting the figure wrong, but boys raise their hand when they're 30% sure versus girls who you know, raise their hand when they're 95% sure of the answer. How does that happen, and how do we avoid that? I think it's relevant to your research. Well, I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I mean, I, th I think, you know, a lot of the ways that we uh, encourage that is, first of all, like, how do we react when someone doesn't have the right answer, right? Do we, do we look down on them? Because a lot of it comes in these sort of interpersonal interactions that we have, and people are responding to those in, in very subtle details. I mean, you can take elementary school kids, and you can tell a teacher, oh, this cur these kids are going to be spurters. They're just going to blossom this year, and these kids are going to kind of lag behind. The teachers, when they interact with the spurters, are going to smile more. They're going to be more encouraging for the exact same behaviors. And so I think a lot of it is really just training people on how to have um, the right reactions for people. But I think also encouraging people. One of the great things about taking the negotiation class, we encourage the students to do things in this class that you don't normally do because you're afraid of the reaction because there's no cost here. Right? Yeah, you might not get it, but who cares if you get a bad outcome? This thing? You're, you're using this to learn. And so getting people to try out, if you're 70% sure, then raise your hand and see what happens. So I think so we're almost out of time. Unfortunately, it's 11.56, and lunch is waiting for us. Um, we have lunch until 12.40, and then we're back here in this room. So I, I hope Adam and Malia might stick around a little bit. So if you have a question, please don't hesitate. <coughs> Thank you, guys. <coughs> Very much.